Only a small number of venture capitalists have taken blockchain technology as seriously as David Pacman. Not to be confused with the hungry yellow video game character of the same name, David's a visionary VC who helped found Apple's music group and led early funding for the crypto kitties. But like the little fella scrambling across the screen to gobble up dots and avoid ghosts, David seeks to invest in the blockchain gems and watch out for bad deals. He's with us today, and we think you'll enjoy the conversation. Also, it's encouraging to see blockchain tools for business owners on the rise. We're happy to chat with Gil Hildebrand from Gilded.Finance about their tool that allows business owners to transact on blockchain more easily. So drop another quarter into the slot and prepare to waka, 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 waka your way through episode number 418 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, Who's bad? Put it in a temple, put it in a temple, put it in a temple. Welcome to the Bad Crypto Podcast, the show for the crypto curious, crypto serious, and nerds like us who grew up playing all the video games. Nerds like us. Nerds like us. Yes, and we are amateur lyricists as well. Glad you guys are here. Welcome to the show. What you know, I remember I'm old enough to remember when the first video game came out uh, up until that point, I was putting quarters in the slots for pinball games at the bowling alley. And then there was Pong like, oh, look at this. There's these two little things and the balls going back and forth. It's like tennis, except more boring. Yeah. And then Space Invaders hit. And that was like a whole new world followed by asteroids and pac-man and of course today we've got amazing video game graphics you know the video game graphics are so good now in some cases if you didn't know it was a video game you'd think it was a tv show yeah super realistic also super realistic is the ability to trade crypto easily on your device, whether that's a mobile device or on your desktop. And our friends at eToro make that super easy to do. You can buy any of 14 different popular coins to trade there. And I mean, they've got what? Something like 12 million registered users now around the world. There's a reason for that. Zero dollar in commission trading fees, the copy trader feature, social trading, and you can get $50 in Bitcoin from myself and Mr. Travis Wright if you follow the simple instructions at this website. This is for U.S. uh, new users to eToro only. Badco.in forward slash eToro is the page you want to go to. This is available for a limited time. Badco.in forward slash eToro. $50 in free Bitcoin. Go check it out, and we're happy to send you some BTC. That is good stuff. We love it. What else is going on today, Mr. Joe Com? We got some interviews. We got uh, this was a fascinating interview that we had with David Pacman talking about, you know, some of the things that he has led and and uh, some of the projects this guy's been a part of, and and how he sees the uh, the blockchain and the crypto world evolving. So maybe we jump in on this one. Let's jump. It takes a visionary to be able to look at the cryptocurrency world and see what the next big thing is going to be. In fact, if you're a successful investor, that visionary trait goes across all kinds of investments. And we've got one of those visionaries with us today. His name is David Pakman. He is a partner in Venrock. They rock. We're going to hear more about them. We're going to hear more about him and find out about some of the cool things he has tossed some dirty fiat at. David, welcome to Bad Crypto. Thank you for having me. It's like to be here. Absolutely. And uh, there won't be any Pac-Man jokes. I mean, that just was one. So you, we you won't hear me go, what, 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 not on this show. We won't stoop that low. You, were, I've heard you do better than that, but I'm uh, not going to ask you if you know Blinky. I'm not going to. I'm scared. Just, I'm scared of those ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> you're a um, you're an early stage consumer and enterprise 
investor for internet companies. And the one, you know, that really pops to me, and I know we're going to cover a bunch of them, is that you led the Series A round for the Crypto Kitties, which broke the internet. So thanks for that. You can thank them. Uh, yeah, I actually invested after they broke the internet. So uh, they did that without me. What was it? The fact that, you know, they said, oh my gosh, this is this is huge. And yeah, if I it think, can break the internet, I want in. Yeah, investors, we, we hope we're a little bit more sophisticated than that in our investment theses. But yeah, like I think the team there was experimenting, right? You know their story and uh, they wanted to make they really like this concept of uh, non fungible tokens. You know, these these little, um, in their case, digital assets that could be you know have some creativity attached to them that are unique and uh, that you could own either for speculation purposes because think it's going to get you know bigger and worth more money, or you can use them in games like like virtual items are used in games, but that they would have some life beyond just the game. Uh, and they there was sort of some um, theoretical uh, or um, mission-driven aspect to what they built because the, anyone who's who's a gamer today knows that virtual items are a critical part of games, but they're not really owned by you. They're owned by the game publisher. If the game publisher decides to make the very rare item that you own no longer rare by making millions more, they can do that. Uh, and so I think the, uh, the Dapper Labs guys were drawn to, the, many of them come from gaming, and they were drawn to this as a, a way of sort of making a contract with the customer that, you know, if there's only 100 of these items, there only will ever be 100 of these items because that's embedded in code. So I think we were excited by the team and their vision. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the main theory is that if there's anything that's going to bring hundreds of millions of people onto crypto, it's going to be gaming, right? Because that's what got a lot of people excited about mobile and got a lot of people excited about the early internet. And, so I think they're, they've got some pretty exciting ideas about how to establish crypto as a mainstream activity and it's using gaming. And we'll find out more next month when they release. You know, looking through your background, you know, just looking through your, through your LinkedIn, you've had a really interesting career, you know, starting as actually, you know, as far back as your, as your profile will go to Apple and, uh, and being the co-founder of the Apple Music Group. Um, I think that's interesting. You've had a lot of really interesting, you know, background with music, with my play, and then also founding eMusic. And so you've spent a lot, and you actually have a Bertelsmann, I think. So you've spent a lot of time in the music space. What are some of the things you're seeing, or, you know, as the evolution of music continues? Is there anything crypto related that you've seen recently or that you might be working on? So I'm uh, passionate about music always have been um, sort of a drummer and a DJ and played in different bands. And so that that was a personal passion of mine. But I happen to be sort of born at the right time for the collision of technology and music, right? Starting in the mid 90s, music was like one of the first two data types to kind of go from atoms to bits to be digitized, right? The first was sort of the newspaper and uh, and uh, as newspapers went online um, and publishing effectively went online and the second was music. So um, I got to ride that wave um, and it was fun. It's amazing how far music's come now as this service where we can literally hear any song uh, at any time on demand. That's amazing. But, um, you know, it's a super challenging industry, largely because it's dominated by rights holders who um, are generally a resistant bunch when it comes to experimentation and doing new things. Um, and they can, if they don't agree uh, with what you want to try to do, they won't let you. Uh, and that's the end of that. Uh, so I think it's a challenging space for entrepreneurs. Um, however, I think well, there's been a lot of people trying to figure out how to put music on the blockchain and what does that mean and why is that good? And the, the one sort of compelling um, idea I've heard, although I think there's some practical ways, uh, pr practical problems with it becoming effective is, you know, today when a artist uh, has a song on Spotify and that song gets played, um, the artist doesn't get paid for many, many months after that. Um, Spotify doesn't have to pay the record label until I don't know, something like uh, 30 or 45 days after the close of the quarter. So, you know, if someone listened on January 1st, the record label gets paid like April 1st or April 15th. Um, and then the record label doesn't have to pay the artist 
uh, until like the next quarter or the quarter after that. So you might not get paid uh, for nine months after your song was played. There's just no technical reason for that. That's really a process and contractual reason. But um, you know, a lot of people have talked about DeFi and the blockchain making sort of streaming payments possible. You've heard this mm -hmm. concept before. Like uh, if I'm uh, getting, I, I could get paid by the hour, even though I normally get paid every two weeks in my job, right? I could get paid mm -hmm. by the minute. Um, we could pay in fractions of cryptocurrency uh, online, right, instantly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think gig workers would appreciate that. A lot of people would rather get paid with a higher frequency, right? So if you can go to streaming payments, I think the music industry could be a super beneficiary of that and artists could get paid, you know, seconds or minutes or days after a song is played. I don't see the music industry adopting that willingly. They love the float, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the artists would, would love it. And so, you know, blockchain's well suited to solve that problem. Well, and the industry is is clearly broken. I mean, this goes back a couple of years, oh, wow. but I remember there being a story about Peter Frampton saying that for 50 million streams of his, you know, his hit song, Baby, I Love Your Way, he got something like 1500 bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah economic. Maybe I don't love your royalties. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. The industry's got a lot of challenges in it, um, but there. So, so I don't think there's like some easy, straight down the fairway applications of blockchain tech that that are going to be adopted quickly and solve a lot of problems. But this one use case seems to be an interesting one to me and uh, has practical problems in launching, but but it could solve could solve a real big issue. So I want to I want to ask you this, David. So you were there early on in Apple at Apple Music Group. Like I remember there was some some really big controversy because there was a, a a small band called the Beatles that had Apple Music. They were Apple Music Corp. Like, were you there during the time whenever there was like a lawsuit stuff going on and Apple and, and Paul McCartney and everybody was sort of freaking out about Apple going into the music space when Steve Jobs had promised they'd never go into music? Yeah, I was there. Well, th that it was essentially always a problem mm -hmm. until it was finally uh, settled in a master settlement. I don't know, maybe like six or seven years ago. When I was there, there had already been an initial settlement done very early mm -hmm. on, a license that where Apple Computer, that's what they were called at the time, promised Apple Music that they were never going to do anything around music. And <laughs> Whoops. We were doing Whoops. <laughs> yeah. And we were, we were trying to do things around music. Yeah. And so, yeah, we spent a lot of time with the corporate lawyers, like, what are we allowed to do? What aren't we allowed to do? And uh, as you saw, what eventually happened was Apple decided, Apple Computer decided to do more things around music. And eventually Apple Records said, you guys are doing more stuff around music. And so another lawsuit and big round of negotiations ensued. And it took some time to settle that out. But it eventually did. It was a big deal. And, you know, it brought the Beatles onto iTunes. And it also gave Apple, what used to be called Apple Computer, but now just Apple Inc., plenty of running room to do whatever they want. Uh, so, yeah, it was a restriction early on. It no longer is. So, David, let's talk a little bit about investing. You know, a lot of people in the crypto world see buying Bitcoin as investing as it is, and it is. But you know, when we're talking about large scale investing in venture capital, a lot of people don't even understand the mechanics of how that works. We start talking about series A rounds and all this. Can you kind of give us a bird's eye investor 101 tutorial? Yeah, sure. Just think about it this way. Um, startups are super high risk, right? The odds are they're going to fail. Depending on what stage of startup you look at, the odds are like between 60 and 90 percent of them are going to fail so if you're a startup entrepreneur you got a couple ideas a couple people you go to a bank you ask for some money they're not going to loan you money <laughs> to start your company and it was really that recognition that there wasn't a lot of capital available to entrepreneurs that led lawrence rockefeller who was the founder of uh, what I, a place i work now venrock um to start doing something that we now call venture investing basically very high risk capital uh, invested in entrepreneurs in exchange for some ownership in the company, minority ownership, and then try to help the entrepreneur build a company to try to beat the odds. That model is now really prevalent. There's a whole industry called venture capital, and it's very high risk capital. Uh, you know, odds are it's gonna we're gonna fail, company's gonna fail, and we're gonna lose all of our money. But the belief is we're more than a bank. The belief is if you put a bunch of people into these seats who have some experience, either they've built companies or they've been investors for a long time 
or they're experts in the domain area that you're investing in, they can help you avoid the fate that the odds predict. So that's what we do. Now there's different stages of when the money goes in and early, maybe for, for purposes of this discussion, think about really early stage, uh, mid or growth stage and late stage investing. And we typically invest in the early stage, which means the business is not proven yet. In some cases, the product hasn't even shipped. So it's super high risk. And uh, we try to pick certain lanes that are markets or business types or technology types that we understand where you have some experience. And we meet with entrepreneurs, try to find the best ones with the best ideas and, and make an investment. So we focus on series A stage companies. For the last five years, that's usually meant companies who have a product already. It's maybe in beta or in market uh, with some modest commercial traction. And we're helping them figure out a business model and helping them scale and get that going. In crypto, the world's a little different because there are different ways to raise startup capital. You might not have to raise equity capital. In 2017, you could pre-sell a bunch of tokens um, and, uh, and use that as your capital to build companies. That's become much harder to do, as you guys know, in the US and most countries because of regulatory challenges. So most crypto projects are back to raising equity capital as a way to get started and maybe selling tokens later. So, so Venrock would be just sort of a portmanteau of venture plus Rockefeller. You got it. That is it. Right. Okay. So, so ask, let me ask about that then, because I think, you know, anytime like you mentioned Rockefeller to some group of people, they get kind of angry and upset. They don't necessarily like the Rockefellers. It kind of gets off on some tinfoil hat stuff. How has it been working there as a, a, at that place? And, and, you know, I think, like, wouldn't it have started like years and years ago? I think there was like, how how long has Venrock been around? And yeah. and 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 maybe sort of tell a little bit of the history of of this organization. So Lawrence Rockefeller started doing what we were talking about. This sort of the the definition of venture capital in like 1939. Mm. So late 30s and early 40s is really when the practice of of uh, the Rockefeller family investing in sort started. of after the Great Depression, huh? Yeah, exactly. And look, they were an oil based. Their, their family made its wealth through oil and the opportunities they saw were largely in transportation, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, airlines Bank and banking. Yeah. Well, most of the early investments were in the uh, consumers of oil mm -hmm. transportation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which made sense. That was what they could see. Oil is going to you know, be really a prominent part of uh, energy source. And why don't we invest in the companies that are going to be built on top of it? Um, that changed over many decades. And in the 60s, in the late 60s, the, the group became more formalized with a bunch of investors around the table. That's when it became known as Venrock. And then in, uh, and started investing in both tech companies. Uh, Venrock was an early investor Series A round in Apple, uh, in Intel, mm -hmm. uh, companies like 3Com. And um, also uh, started to invest in uh, healthcare and biotech companies, both me medical devices and uh, drugs, um, and now a lot of different healthcare technology businesses. Um, and in the mid 90s, it became really like a traditional venture capital firm. What I mean by that is the Rockefeller family is one small investor in the firm, and the firm has a whole bunch of other typical LPs, as they're called investors, just like most of the other VC firms. So, so what was the answer to your question is we've been around about 50 years uh, while being known as Venrock. It's interesting. And if you actually look at the history of that, though, it's like you can see how some of the and there's been a few, you know, really successful families who got in certain industries really early and made a whole lot of money. And then you can see how they took that money and influence and then spread out across all these different industries. Right. And then they they purchased all these different media conglomerates and all this different. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you look at the tree of how some of these really early successful entrepreneurs, J.P. Morgan and some of these other ones, just how they sort of branched out. And, and how, how they were able to, to, to gather so much influence and control over so many areas. Yeah, and let's, let's just pause on that for a minute because that cycle of an entrepreneur has an idea, takes a bunch of risk, builds a company around it, the company is successful, the early employees and the founders accumulate a bunch of wealth, and then make high-risk bets in more entrepreneurs like themselves is a fantastic cycle, right? It's a, it's a wonderful um, ecosystem because the... Um, successful founder 
has a model for the challenges that they've seen and can help other new founders sort of steer around the um, the inevitable uh, sh challenges that they will face and help them overcome those. And so you see this a lot, right? And that's actually what angel investing really is. It's often uh, founder or early stage um, technology employees who have built some wealth up through success, investing in their friends and other people in the ecosystem they know to help new startups grow. And so I think that's an amazing aspect of uh, sort of tech and healthcare. Yeah. Startups. I would agree as long as their 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 mission is altruistic, right? I mean, that's one thing I liked about Andrew Carnegie was that he donated a lot of his wealth to a lot of great causes and stuff, right? Whereas some, you know, and I think, you know, you know, John D. Rockefeller, very smart, very shrewd businessman. If you dive down into that and you kind of see where he branched off through over the years, like even how he influenced the educational system and and all these other areas, right? It's sort of like, and that's kind of how while we're in the system today of, of that, it's like Go to school, become a cog in somebody else's engine, for the most part, is what the school system sort of sit down, shut up, listen to us. We're going to tell you what to think, and then you're, we're going to, it's going to be on the test, right? But they don't teach us how to be entrepreneurs, right? School doesn't teach you how to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't teach you about the rule of 72, compounding interest. It doesn't teach you about a lot of this. It teaches you how to be a cog, right? And so... I, I love the fact that, you know, I love entrepreneur, I, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. And I love the capitalism. But it's like, when when are we going to get to a point when sort of capitalism has to be conscious capitalism? And it's like, we can't just go full bore all the time because a lot of people can end up getting hurt. I just real I just read it. I think today that said 50 percent of Americans now at the end of April are going to have no savings left. They're going to they've run through. They've run through it. So I think a lot of capitalism on steroids is the rich get so rich, but it doesn't always trickle down to the people who sort of help make it make it happen sometimes, right? So I think it's and I think people are really feeling the the pain of some of that now. It's like a, it's like we're in the craziest time we've ever experienced as humans that are on earth right now. Like we've not seen anything like this. We've not seen the tsunami that's coming yet. Right. We've just seen, oh, we heard there was an earthquake, but we don't, we don't see the tides coming in yet. And it's going to crush a whole lot of people. And, uh, you know, it's like I think that, you know, con how are we going to trans, you know, transfer into a more conscious capitalism society where it's like where, where the winners where we can all kind of win? Is that is that something you've thought about and how we can maybe move into a place like that? Uh, I'll touch on something you, you said there, which is that. Um, there seems to be a couple different career paths for us, right? One is to work at someone else's company mm -hmm. and you might categorize that as being a cog in a wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not, maybe you can make some great progress and, and really make a lot of impact at that company. Or another is to, if you've got a great idea or a passion about solving a hard problem, take a path where you create your own company. Mm -hmm. And so we think a lot about how do we get more people to not really follow the rules but to take the risk and start their own company. Because if a percentage of them are right, we th those new companies do a bunch of things. One, they solve a hard problem and if people are paying them for it, then people obviously wanted it. And two, it creates wealth. It creates wealth for everyone who has equity in the company, which hopefully is every employee. So we've done research on this. And one of the sad conclusions of the research is, guess who are the people who are comfortable taking the most risk? They're the people who have a safety net. Mm. Or they come from a wealthy family or I don't, I don't mean super wealthy. I mean, you know, just someone with some parents who can cover their expenses for a while. Um, they're um, they've got a safety net. And yeah. so that is um, we think a lot about how do you uh, spread the opportunity to start companies and be entrepreneurial into a, a more even distribution of talent. Right. They, their talent is evenly distributed. Opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, everyone who's talented has good ideas or you know, has ideas. We'd like them all to get, uh, you know, swings of the bat. Um, so we do think about that. And you know, there are some organizations that have worked on that. The, the second part of your question is like, uh, given the massive second and third order, order effects that are going to come from the present day recession and impact of the virus, is there opportunity to reshape the way the world works, <laughs> which is a super big mm, question. Right, true. But a lot of people are thinking about this is if you ever were going to push the reset switch on some things, now is a great time because right. the system is failing and it is failing in front of everyone's eyes. 
Uh, and so we're actually spending most of our time right now after triaging our portfolio companies, brainstorming what will the world be like permanently different as you know, a- after this virus and how do we address the needs of, of uh, that will emerge because of that? What are, what are entrepreneurs thinking about that? What new problems exist? Because some great companies will be built in the wake mm-hmm. of the disaster. That was actually my follow-up question. So you've bridged that perfectly because as we see, you know, timestamp this interview for um, April 23rd. This will be airing in the future. So to let everybody know where we are as of now, there's about 25, 26 million people that have filed for unemployment. I see one of the companies that, you know, you had the foresight to invest in in Benrock is a doctor on demand, right? Talk to a a licensed physician from your computer, smartphone, tablet. That makes a lot of sense. But as you are in your conference calls and your Zoom meetings with your uh, co-workers, what are you guys seeing? What are the trends going to lead to and where are the opportunities? I think you um, categorize them into a couple different buckets. Um, the first is things that already sort of existed but will now experience rapid acceleration, either because of need, like today we have to do video calls and phone calls because we can't do in-person meetings, we just cannot. And commerce requires a whole bunch of meetings and education requires some sort of communication and connection and telehealth requires a a conversation with healthcare worker. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that was already built that can be adapted or focused on the current day problems. And those are exploding. And you've heard all about those, you know, Zoom and Doctor on Demand is one and obviously Instacart and delivery of groceries and all this kind of stuff, Uber Eats. Um, But that's the easy stuff to see. Um, The hard stuff is, well, what's after that? What needs do we have right now that are actually unmet? And you're starting to hear about it. Like one is, well, Zoom fatigue. Right. Why is it that after I don't know about you guys, but I'm doing eight to 14 hours of meetings a day right now on Zoom or on Google Hangouts. And I am way more exhausted after that day than I am with a day that's a mix of human interaction and then some video interaction. So I did a little bit of reading on that. There's a whole bunch of reasons, I think, why it is true that we're feeling the fatigue. Um, And it's because these products really actually the, the product we're using right now, the way that we're looking at each other is not optimized for like our biology. It raises the, the fight or flight reflex. Um, seeing I don't, a, I don't want to fight. <laughs> and I'm not running away, I want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Explain that, what do you mean? Um, well, yeah, I, I'm not an expert on this at all, but um, for instance, one thing is, so the image I'm looking at right now is, uh, is a video of Joel and a video of Travis and a video of me. And seeing when we meet with someone in real life, we don't see us. There's not a big mirror behind them. And apparently there's a whole bunch of sort of cognitive load that's placed on us when we see ourselves. We, we maybe even not consciously, but we think about how do I look? Maybe, you know, am I happy with that? Uh, um, and so there, there's a turn bunch off my video to yeah, lower my cognitive load. Hey, get your face out of here, Joel. It stresses me out. I see it every day. <laughs> um, you know, so, so that's one thing is like the product should not be built to show an image of you, even though you do want to make sure you're on camera, right? But we can have a tool do that for you. But you don't want to be staring at you, first of all. Another thing is that um, this sort of image of like, you know, from uh, mid chest to the head, um, it does, tra- you know, that's not how we we really meet. We don't come up to each other and stand like uh, eight inches away or 14 inches away. <laughs> like it's not how we meet. But it's scary to do that, right? It's like, why is this person challenging me? And I'm a face. What we do is we we, we we recline a little bit more, right? We're, we're in a less con- confrontational um stance these are probably biologically adapted traits to make uh, to be you know have some social lubrication some grease for us to have an easier conversation that is not uh challenging the biological reactions that we have uh you know so look again i I don't know a lot about this but i know that entrepreneurs are probably thinking about well if we are in an environment where we have to spend tons of time doing virtual conversations first of all what when don't we, when can we do this differently? So we don't need to do a conversation every time. Like how can we automate things or how, um, how can we make this a more efficient meeting? Like I could see an AI agent in this meeting, taking notes for us or listening for cues that are, that are like follow-ups and then mm-hmm. triggering cues or emails for us. There's a whole bunch of stuff I think that can be built 
to make this a better experience that's more efficient that a bunch of entrepreneurs are probably taking notes on right now and starting companies around. You know, we were having a, Joel and I were having a conversation last night, chatting with a dude who does a lot of, who builds some cool apps. And he actually uh, took took all these public Zooms and like made a directory so people can, and you can actually submit your own Zoom. So then you can just go in and, and have connections and it's called zoomies.video. But one of the interesting statistics that we were chatting about was at the end of 2019, Zoom had about 10 million users. At the, at the 1st of April, they had 200 million users, and now they have 300 million users. They've grown over 100 million users so far this month. Like, that is unprecedented, it would seem, in any sort of social, video, streaming, anything. The amount of growth that that has had. Have you ever have you ever seen any kind of growth that sort of, you know, just, it's like stratosphere type of stuff? No, and first of all, just to put a finer point on it, the numbers you're citing are their daily users. These daily are- users? Holy oh, shit. Yeah. How did they scale? How, were, how oh could they be prepared for that? that? So that article needs to be written. Like, obviously, their CTO and their tech team is too busy to do interviews right now, but uh, they are going to be a model. They're, they're, this case studies will be written about how did they – they obviously had a bunch of infrastructure in place to scale, but how could they have managed that kind of growth without a single hiccup? I mean, sure, there's the security issues around the Zoom product, but I have not had a single issue with the network. It has never said, uh, can't connect. I mean, we all have our own local bandwidth issues, but that's not Zoom's fault. So it works. It works. It's incredible. So, and, and so are many of the other products, Skype and the others. So like, people are going to talk about this and write about it. Um, and no, Skype, I've never seen Skype has always been issue. You know, like, Ever since Microsoft bought it, the quality for me just always seemed to go down. No, and that's no, kind of no offense, it, Microsoft. That's kind of why Zoom's working because it just works, right? right. Um, but I think you're, um, you're, we have, we have some products that are companies that have grown fifteen to thirty percent a day in the first few weeks of this, uh, and have had to deal with you know they're, uh, I call I call them counter COVID companies, right? They're counter to the cycle where everyone else is experiencing decline. And softer demand, these companies are reinforced by it. And yeah, managing growth that's it's up and to the right on a steep curve is hard. Yeah. So let's take the same um, overview now of the crypto world, right? This seems to be the time as, you know, the U.S. government is printing more and more fiat currency, pouring it into the economy at unprecedented rates. I mean, we're so used to it now. It's like, oh, another 500 billion. Okay. Big deal. Yeah. Go, what Your thoughts on all of that? Yeah. I, I kind of don't understand why Bitcoin is not at 30,000 right now, because if ever there was the evidence you needed that um, we, we uh, our central governments manage uh, our fiat currencies uh, in ways that are, um, that don't prioritize limited supply. Right. Um, and if you care about, you know, the inflationary result that can happen there or the deflationary result that can happen there, like, you know, crypt- crypto assets with fixed guaranteed supplies are an antidote for that. So, I, you know, the, pe- the people who follow Bitcoin pricing, which is not my area of expertise, you know, have some reasons for this. But look, Bitcoin's pretty strong right now, n- nevertheless, given uh, where things are. Um, I guess I feel like the... The biggest problem to me with crypto, I'm not a religious crypto investor. Like I'm a very practical kind of evidence-based investor. And what attracted me in general to crypto is the the architectural change in the web that can result from web three, right? The, the centralized model, we see who won. The platforms won, they won big. And they're like, they're printing money, even in the bad times. Like uh, Google's ad revenue could go down 30%. The business is going to be fine. Amazon counter COVID doing just fine. Uh, but the platforms have unbelievable power because it's built on the aggregation of our data. And so the idea that you could have a decentralized web where the data is effectively controlled by the user and it, um, it, it makes it impossible for data centric platforms to dominate is a very appealing model to me, to software developers and, and maybe ultimately to users. But so I like that notion. The problem is when you, when you try to explain that to a customer, like you shouldn't use Facebook, you should instead use a decentralized version of Facebook. 
It was like, well, there isn't really one of those and none of my friends are on it. So here's the, here's a framework I think about, which maybe helps explain what we're all looking for here. Um, the Pew Tr Charitable Trust did a, released a survey of, uh, of 10,000 people. Why the questions were, why do you like Netflix? And the answers were number one, they don't have any commercials. Number two, I can stream whatever I want when I want. So it's on demand viewing. And number three was um, I can binge watch whatever I want to watch. Like when I like something I, I watch, I can finish it, you know, in, in a marathon. Number four was I like the shows. So the first three reasons why streaming video, streaming TV is so successful is because it fixes all of the problems with television, right? It's the anti legacy TV. So the way you get millions of users to use something is by doing something better, like offering a product that fixes or makes better the old way of doing it. Or it's a whole new thing, but still it's better. The idea of like calling a car that arrives in a minute from your phone is better than waiting in the rain for a taxi and having to pay the old fashioned way. Like these are better models. So what is it about dApps, decentralized apps, that's better than the old model? And the only answer that most people come up with is, well, it's, it's censorship resistant, right? The platform can't shut you down. Well, only a very small number of people in the world have experienced platforms shutting them down or censorship. So there's not millions of users for the decentralized censorship resistant products. So the question I ask all the DAP developers that I meet is, what is it that's better about the product? Why will consumers love it? And most of the answers are not because it's decentralized. So it has to be better, really exciting for some other reasons. Um, now, I think for instance, we talked about Dapper Labs, they are releasing a product next month um, that is in partnership with the NBA. It is um, called NBA Top Shot. And this will be the first time that you can buy moments, famous moments or moments that occurred at the at, at previous games of your favorite players doing awesome dunks or threes or you know great moments. And you could own them and there'll be a scarcity. There'll be only a certain number of those moments made. And you will own them and you will own it uh, verifiably, and no one can take it away from you. The NBA can't print a whole bunch of more later. You can own rare moments and you can speculate on them and you can use them in games. So what is it about the, that that is, is so exciting? Well, it's not that it's built on a blockchain. Like that's not why consumers will come. It's because of the attributes we just talked about that first of all, it's the NBA. It's awesome. Two, it's yours. You you own it verifiably. You do, you can buy it and speculate with the confidence of knowing that no one can take it away. You can trade it on open exchanges everywhere. And three, there's some games that you can use it in that hopefully will be awesome. So it's an interesting experiment um, that I'm excited to see how it goes. Yeah. Now, is that is that something around like NFTs, the non fungible tokens that sort of excites you? Because I know we, Joel and I were really big in NFTs, and actually on a lot of our podcasts we actually do this thing called proof of listening. And during the episode, we will tell them where to get the NFT. And then they have 72 hours to claim it from when the show goes live. So it sort of incentivizes people to listen early on, and then they can go claim a unique design NFT. And then we've done eight of them so far. And, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of fans really like that. And we, we were at NFT NYC and, um, you know, we saw the NFL is there. They're thinking about how to use digital assets. And the, the NBA is there. And then while we were there, the UFC was talking about how you could actually create a little non-fungible token. And then and then you can train him up. And then he can go and fight other people. Like, like, so there's so many different things when you start getting into these digital collectibles. I mean, I was even thinking about this. is like when you can tie in the physical and the digital, right? It's like I have a 1941 play ball, Ted – Williams, that's a, you know, it's 10 out of 10 on, on the, on the ranking of this thing, because it's such a high quality, but it's like, I own this, but sure it would be cool if I had the digital authentic sort of verification of this somewhere on a blockchain that this is mine. And then if I sell it, I have proof of ownership, right? Because I think that proof of ownership is some way it's like, yeah, here's something that's valuable, but is it actually yours? How do we know that it's yours? And I think that with non-fungible tokens, it, it offers this really interesting space in the collectible area. And I think that it's, it's pretty cool. What are some of your maybe additional thoughts on NFTs? Yes, we're, we're definitely talking about that here. The NBA moments are, are NFTs themselves. Mm. Um, so I, I totally subscribe to your idea. I think you're talking about ideas that have mass appeal, like you know, 
collecting baseball cards, Pokemon cards, shoes, artwork. It's something that we do as humans. It's, you know, not every Tom, Dick and Ashley, you know, is a collector, but many people at one point in their life collect something. And um, so the notion of collecting, especially around sports, is highly prevalent. And so I, I, this, this category of NFTs for sports, uh, allowing crypto collectibles to emerge in, this, in, this, in sports, to me, is the most exciting place to start. Agree. Uh, so I'm psyched that, and the leagues get it for sure, because they've mm-hmm. been doing baseball cards forever. And right. the problem with baseball cards is uh, whenever that uh, 1951 Ted Williams, you know, sells for uh, a couple million dollars or the, uh, um, the cigar card, the, uh, own, uh, the T206 Wagner. Honus Wagner. Yeah. Honus Wagner, every time that sells the, the, uh, you know, major league baseball doesn't get, doesn't get a penny. Right. right. They got it. They got, they probably got, they probably got a penny the first time it was sold. And that was it. So uh, downstream um, revenue on every sale is possible with NFTs, right? The, the leagues can always participate every time, their players trade or their moments oh, trade. Huge. I wonder how you might apply that to music. You know, right now, music, there's no scarcity. Uh, you release it on a stream and it's gone and that, you know, and anybody can have them. There could be millions and millions of copies of it. Have you ever thought through what would it be like if there was limited copies of music that's like the really- wu-tang clan did they had they, they they made an album with only one copy of it and that martin shrekley guy that uh, pharmaceutical bro guy who went to jail he bought it Scrally, and that's, a, that's Scr- the, right yeah, that Scrally, yeah. Scrally. yeah that's, there's only one and i've never heard it i think it's interesting like it's so scarce you can't even hear it so i do think that uh there is scarcity collectible opportunities around music i don't think it's actually the music itself right i think it's the the gold records, the guitars, the, you know, the, mm. the artifacts of music are absolutely collectible. There, there are a lot of guitar collectors. The hard uh, rock cafe sort of memorabilia stuff, right? Totally. And, and I was really lucky this winter. I got to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's filled with like artifacts. That's what it is. It's awesome no, place, yeah. There it's artifacts. And mm-hmm. it's pretty, pretty amazing to see the clothing worn by, uh, you know, Fleetwood Mac or the Beatles. Uh, yeah. or- There's Ringo's drums. Like, and you're like, what? That's freaking awesome. Yeah, no, I totally. Keith Moon's drum sets there. It's yeah. And so, so that, that stuff I could see there being, I could see digital collectibles around music with scarcity, but I don't think it's going to be the music itself. I don't think it's going to be like, I have, I mean, there are music industry execs that are like, I have the secret basement tapes of U2 from 1978. Like, okay, great. But no one else can ever hear that. So it's hard for you to establish the value of it because I never hear it. Well, if an artist, and this is just an idea, were to come out and say, we're offering a million, um, you know, versions that are tokenized of this sure anybody can hear the music but to say i've got one of these that is you know the verified validated copy on my computer and i it's tokenized and i can sell that i I think it's an interesting model i'll tell you what i I think is scarce about music that uh is really rising in the time of covid which is you know live streaming um, and live streaming that's non-recorded, like this is a single performance. There's, I mean, maybe you can hack something together to, to record it, but it's not going to be available for playback on YouTube or Twitch. It's only a live stream. A lot of people are doing this, right? A lot of artists are doing it right now. There's no touring around the world. The only thing you can do, fans are dying to connect. And I have some experience myself here. I am an amateur DJ and I've been DJing a couple times on some of the platforms, just doing live streams. And boy, the music industry couldn't make it any harder. For you to do this there are so many rights issues facebook live shuts you off within 10 minutes as soon as they detect a few songs just YouTube, they don't strikes you. youtube gives you the hammer and you get all these emails about copyright infringement uh, the only place you can really get away with it right now is twitch and mixer um but i think periscope uh, via twitter yeah maybe i don't know i didn't try that platform uh i mean you you want to you want to plug your computer into something to, you know, you want to plug your instruments into something to stream. Like you, it's hard to do it to a phone like Instagram live. But anyway, my, my point is just that there, there, it, this is a moment you, you talk, we talk about like what's emerging as new behavior that was sort of there before, but not that big, definitely live streaming music performances are a thing right now, but it's like running from the copyright police. Like there's no way to be legal about it. You can't even, you can't even pay somebody if you wanted to do it. If you wanted to like write a $200 check to ASCAP and just let yourself stream, you can't. So uh, 
that we need the rights holders to respond. Well, this is uh, this has been really interesting, David, and uh, I think we're going to have to have you back because I really like the way you think about these things and look at the world. And uh, we appreciate you coming on today and sharing with us. Honored to be on with both of you. I appreciate it. I mean, I won't tell everyone that you both are appearing in your underwear when you do this thing, but it's still it's still cool. Well, again, the video here is only from the chest up, so you yes, don't sir. really know that to be left, true. Left, 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 well, we actually, we podcast commando. Actually. There's a mirror behind you. I can see. <laughs> yeah, it actually, it actually is true. You know, David's been popping up on a lot of national TV as well. So we're really fortunate that he got to, um, that we got to interview him here. Yeah. Before we popped somewhere else, we're glad that he was here with us. What, 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 what? Dude, you know, you know how much that guy's gotten that over his life. I bet it was just oh, relentless. Yeah, not nonstop. I'm sure. Not um, we're not. We weren't that clever on this one, so folks. We we had fun with it, but we're not clever. We never claim to be clever. I, that is nowhere. It is not the clever crypto podcast. It is not the smart crypto podcast. It is not the super wise or intelligent crypto podcast. It's that bad. is true. That is true. It's bad. So remember last year, Travis, when we got to go to Bali for that mastermind event? I remember last year before the world went crazy. I kind of yeah. I uh, vaguely recall. I love Bali. Love, love, love Bali. Thought that what a, what a great destination. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to meet Gil Hillebrand. Gil is the CEO of gilded and you know what i probably introduced him in this interview as well so let's just go to that interview and look who's checking in here with a, a quick catch up from virtual blockchain week one of our sponsors it's gil hildebrand the ceo of gilded the website gilded finance forget paypal it's time to do payments on blockchain gil how's it going hey joel thanks for having me it's going really well yeah, man. So kind of give us a, a quick elevator speech of what you guys are all about and then tell us what you're up to. Sure. So what Gilded is doing is uh, creating a business layer for uh, blockchain and digital currency that enables a business to actually integrate digital currency into their uh, the tools and the processes that they use for payments. So basically, our goal is uh, for a business to be able to you know, pay their suppliers and vendors overseas or to receive payment uh, from their customers using digital currency and have that experience be just as seamless as using, you know, uh, a traditional money transfer service. And the but way that what we I, what, I, what I like about that, Gil, is that you're like integrating with some traditional services, right? So right. if people are used to QuickBooks, they can still use that and bring this data in. I think that's the key, Joel, because uh, QuickBooks has 30 million customers. Um, Zero has over 2 million customers. Uh, we integrate with uh, PipeDrive, which is a CRM, which is really cool. You can actually have your sales team kickstart uh, the invoicing and payment process automatically. Um, and they, they've got like 50,000 customers. So when you look at bringing this technology you know, to the masses, uh, you've got to look for the distribution channels. And why not go to the tools that people are already using? And you're supporting a bunch of different cryptos. What currencies are you uh, leaning on? Um, obviously, we support uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those actually are where we're seeing the most payment volume today. But mm -hmm. uh, stablecoin payment volume is growing uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, we're seeing uh, Tether, uh, USDC, and DAI are all being used for payments. And that's really where we see this heading because, um, you know, businesses, most businesses aren't in the, uh, you know, they don't speculate on foreign currencies and uh, we don't expect them to do that here. Um, and what we're finding is like uh, actually something really interesting, which is that the, the stable coin issuers are uh, making the fees to deposit and withdraw digital currency from a bank account very, very, very cheap compared to a crypto exchange. And so this is creating like an arbitrage where uh, a business can actually use these stablecoin issuers to, you know, uh, purchase a stablecoin and do it uh, for very low fee. And it actually makes 
the overall uh, competitiveness compared to banks and, and other money transfer options like way better than we've ever seen before. Let me pause here for a second because I saw a story I want to um, speak to if you haven't seen it yet on Cointelegraph. Here we go. Um, you know, I'm just curious. A story just broke here recently on Cointelegraph, and uh, you know, apparently the president has a new nominee for the Federal Reserve, and uh, this guy says that he would advocate a gold-backed currency, even a crypto one, for a, a stable coin. I'm curious. What are your thoughts on that? Um, he would back it in terms of like. Um you know, the government backing it or right, 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 right. Okay. So uh, Judy Shelton is um, Trump's new nominee for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And this person's advocated for getting back to a gold standard, possibly in a very cryptocurrency way. Well, if you've ever read the Bitcoin standard, uh, it's really, you know, it's really uh, hard not to love the gold standard. And that book made it clear um, how many economic woes have uh, befallen us since we got off of that standard. Um, I think if you were going to, you know, create a currency that's gold backed, it might as well be digital currency. And actually Paxos has that today, which is really cool. Well, then we know that it's backed by something, right? People right. are like, Oh, Bitcoin's not backed by anything. I'm like, have you seen the printing presses that are backing the, you know, the ongoing never ending incessant printing of fiat currency? Yeah, it, it's it's ridiculous, and I, I think that this is honestly going to be a game changer for digital currency. We we actually stop saying uh, crypto and cryptocurrency. We say digital currency because uh, for the masses, it seems to be a little less cryptic, if you will. Well, they understand digital money already because, in a way, that's kind of what PayPal is, right? You never actually hold money in your hands. You don't write a check. You just click a button, say, send this much from point A to point B, yeah, and it's done. So crypto really isn't a big leap from what we're already trained to do. I love the the phrase, uploading money to the internet. I think oh. that's, that's so great. I like that too. I don't know that I've ever heard that, but uploading money to the, I like to download money from the internet. Let's We're still working like on that algorithm. Download. Well, that, I guess downloading money from the internet would be mining, right? That's, that's true. How, that's, that's how true. you download. So, you know, you guys don't accept bad coin yet as, you know, a, a payment, um, you know, crypto, but that's okay. Maybe we'll, you know, we'll onboard that here because there's got to be at least ones of people that would, you know, <laughs> I think I've got a few of those somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, people are people are mining it. Anyway, back to Gilded. Um, people can try it out for free. They can get a demo from you. I think we had some sort of special offer for people who attended Virtual Blockchain Week. And if we want to extend that to the bad crypto audience in general, um, would you be down with that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, Gilded is actually uh, free to use. We offer a free tier. Uh, but if you want to upgrade, uh, it starts at $48 a month, and that'll give you access to, uh, to be able to integrate with tools like uh, QuickBooks and to be able to export all of your data for accounting purposes. And we do have a uh, coupon code that's going to give you 25% uh, uh, off of your subscription. So that's bad crypto underscore 25. Excellent. Well, we appreciate you offering that to our people. But guys, it's it's free. If you're getting payments and you want to see the power of Gilded with invoicing, 0% digital fee payments, automated bookkeeping, and Coinbase and Stripe integration, yeah, so you get all of that in the free version. So gilded.finance, again, use crypto, use the code badcrypto underscore 25 for 25% off if you decide to upgrade to the premium model. And that's what lets you, it gets, a, there's a higher, you know, threshold and you could sync it with QuickBooks and unlimited wallets and all kinds of other cool stuff. So Gil, thanks for coming on. Thanks for creating a cool tool, offering a discount to our people and uh, for staying bad. All right, Joel, thanks. Thanks, Gil. Great project, great site. And again, if you guys go to vbw20.com forward slash gilded, G-I-L-D-E-D, and use the code badcrypto underscore 15, you get 15% off the services there at Gilded.
That is. That is great. And thank you so much to them. They were one of our sponsors on uh, the Virtual Blockchain Week, which was a great success. We really enjoyed that putting that thing together, even though in 30 days from start to finish, it got a little stressful. No, a, little bit. a little bit stressful. And then after that, we said, okay, we're finished with that. What next? And then we're on to blockchain heroes. Something and a little less stressful. Is I haven't been stressed at all during this process. Well, we have help. You know, there's a, there's actually 11 of us working on blockchain heroes. The Telegram is already growing super quickly. If you guys haven't joined it yet, go to t.me. Uh, forward slash BC heroes for our telegram group. The we are revealing each day multiple hero cards from the set of 50 and the buzz is growing in social media. Uh, I, I just today, by the time this episode comes out, we will have revealed card number one, which is Genesis. Uh, this is the card, the hero inspired by the one and only Satoshi Nakamoto. And Travis, I, I think that this card is going to be one of the most in-demand cards from the set. I, I do believe. I think it's, I mean, when we were talking about it, it's like, man, we really need to make sure that the one based on Satoshi Nakamoto is really cool. And wow, the artist delivered super. Yeah, this I'm blown away. You know, when you see in your mind this vision of what stuff is going to look like and then you see professionals make it a reality, it's like, damn, that's even sweeter than I imagined. Mm -hmm. Well, because that's the whole thing it's, it, that, um, you know, when you really put this thing together, you go, you don't have if you have an idea, you don't have to do it all. Like that's one thing a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs make a mistake of. They try to do everything themselves. And with today, with crowdsourcing and uh, sites like Fiverr and Upwork and other places out there, you can hire experts who can do something at much less than you can try to do it yourself. Oh, and it will come out way better. I would have stick figures. That would be, you know, my, <laughs> maybe I'm going to have my own set of NFTs and it's just a bunch of stick figure people. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a lot of crap out there where NFTs are concerned, you know, because it's still early and it's a novelty for a lot of people. Speaking of the NFTs, um, we announced the commemorative NFT for Blockchain Heroes that we want to give to you for free and drop into your wax wallet. Um, you still have a few more days as of this broadcast, which is the uh, 15th of June to claim this. If you go to Badco dot in forward slash hero it'll take you to the page it'll instruct you how to set up a wax wallet in under 60 seconds and put your address in so that we can airdrop this collectible nft to you uh, at the end of the promotion so fancy we're so fancy with our giveaways but you're going to want this because here's the thing there's going to be a lot of people out there collecting these things over time and they're not going to be able to get this one unless they buy it on a secondary market and they can only buy it on a secondary market if somebody sells it on the secondary mm -hmm. market. So mm -hmm. you might want to get yourself some. Hoddle yours. I, we we don't know if you know if these things are going to have value. We're collect we're creating them because they're cool. We think other people are going to enjoy the cards a whole lot, and what the secondary market decides to do with them is is completely up to the peoples of the uh, the blockchain. Right? Do it. Do it, yeah. peoples. Uh, also, I, I don't know if we mentioned this when we announced the card set last uh, Friday, Travis, but this project is actually being funded completely by Wax Labs. We put mm -hmm. in a proposal to their, um, uh, they have a, like 100 million Wax in their stash that are set aside for projects that they deem are, are worthy. And we're the first collectible trading card set to have gotten thumbs up. In fact, we might be the only one so far. I don't know. Uh, I've not seen others. So this is uh, Wax is totally behind this. And they actually shared it out in their newsletter just yesterday. Did you they see did. that? I yeah. did not see that. I know they're tweeting about it regularly, but uh, that's yeah. cool. It was a This Week in Wax thing. So the momentum is building. The launch of the cards is going to be August 4th. And we're actually, Travis, talking about ways that we can do a pre-launch to people who want to pay in Wax instead of using Dirty Fiat. Mm, yeah, that Dirty Fiat. Ew. Mm. But you know what? It was such an easy on-ramp whenever they were doing that with Garbage Pail Kids. You literally just 
connected your uh, connected your debit card and boom, you're able to buy them easily. But I think it makes sense that they buy with crypto. So I would love to have the opportunity for them to to buy in wax. That makes sense. We're just we're gonna make it happen. Make and it happen. For those, yeah. For those of you that are digging this whole NFT and in um, the future of digital collectibles and in having digital assets on blockchain, make sure you tune in to the Nifty Show. This is our other podcast that we actually do live on video we stream it to multiple locations every friday at 5 p.m eastern time two o'clock pacific you can go watch it at nifty.show forward slash theta also find us on our bad crypto youtube channel and the bad crypto mastermind on facebook on the bad crypto twitter uh, all the places that we pop up you know whether you know we're there or not we're there and uh, we would invite you to come. This week, our guest is going to be uh, Jody Rich from Cred, and they're doing some really innovative things with uh, NFTs for conferences, and they're gonna unveil how they're using NFTs for Zooms. Yep, you heard me right, Zooms, you know, the video conferencing software. They're doing something really cool. Jody's gonna reveal that this Friday. Anything else there on your side in uh, Kansas, Mr. Travis Wright, or no, Missouri, just, or wherever I, the hell you are? I would just say this, you know, if you guys are really curious about the whole Blockchain Heroes thing that we're launching, you wanna be up to date on that, the best place to do that would be the Telegram group, which is t.me forward slash BC Heroes. If you want to take a look at all the heroes that we've launched so far, you can go to our Instagram. Mr. Joel Combs setting those up over there. That's uh, uh, BC Heroes is our username there. And you can go to bcheroes.com. I'm actually updating the header image right now to show all of the uh, characters that we have launched so far. Very similar to how I set it up with the uh, virtual blockchain week. We had everybody, all the speakers heads up there. Well, now we're going to have all the little all the little characters are going to be popping up at the top of the, the website here. So cool. You know, we, uh, as Travis likes to say, we're dog fooding this. We're not just talking blockchain. We're, we're eating this stuff up. We want to be um, part of the ecosystem beyond just interviewing people and sharing. We want to actually make an impact on mass adoption of this and we think that blockchain heroes is going to help move the needle and by virtue of that you guys are help moving the needle you are part of this blockchain revolution that's taking place so thanks for listening and um yeah i, I was gonna say stay bad but then you looked like you wanted to say something yeah so i mean I'm it's really the whole bad. I'm it's not really the, the whole mission when we set up the show is like we want to help be part of you know, the mass adoption and helping teaching, help, help teaching people about how it all works and why it's all important. You know, it's one of the reasons why we played around and created a, a, a blockchain, bad coin, right? We've done a lot of different things. We put on a virtual conference. We've done this show now for almost three years. In fact, we're about one month away from our uh, three three years where we yeah. had that uh, first idea to do it. Yeah, we're June we're on June 15th right now. And July 16th was the day we had the idea back in 2017. So we've been on this journey now with you guys for about three years and neither Joel nor I have, have killed the other. So that's yet, good. Yet, there's still hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing we're in different locations or there might have been strangling at a few points. Yeah, there's not been F you, F you. Well then, F, well, then shut up, well then go then. Well then we'll stay back. I, I don't think we've actually ever cursed each other out. No, I mean, maybe you know, our, maybe I think the stress during virtual blockchain week was close. Yeah, that was, that was super close. Okay, like he said, stay bad. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor. 
Blockchain heroes coming to kick your blockchain ass. Pow.